So let me begin by saying this, is, <clears throat> this has been a truly exciting conference, and um, I feel there's been a buzz of excitement throughout the week, um, complemented by the fact that the uh, speakers have given such brilliant talks with such visionary conclusions that it makes it particularly difficult, I think, for, for me to, you know, uh, to better that. <clears throat> so let me begin, then, by asking if I can work this thing. So my first question is, what on earth is a vision talk? Um, we've seen such a wide range of talks this week um, covering such wide areas of the subject that it's almost impossible to imagine how one would condense that into a small 15-minute uh, um, uh, set of, uh, of statements. Um, but one general overriding statement seems to be that, as this conference has illustrated more than ever before, that the subject of string theory has blossomed from being um, it, from its original intention, perhaps, of being a theory of string-like elementary particles into something which I think is much more, much more significant in some ways because it's a sort of framework which reaches out in all directions and many of which have been represented this week in topics which range from nitty-gritty condensed matter physics to um, physics of the, of, the, um, of the whole universe. Um, this is in keeping with the history of the subject. The string theory has has changed in unpredictable ways ever since it first began. And that's, in fact, I think, what makes most of us think of this as being an exciting um, and challenging subject. Um, but since it's unpredictable, it makes vision very difficult. So um, I will do my best, but I will do it in a very limited sense. Um, I've been pestering my colleagues, mostly in Cambridge, but also this week here, um, for ideas of what they think uh, uh, the future of the subject will be. Um, and um, in particular, in a five-year time frame, which is what the organizers suggested was needed. Um, and of course, I've come, they've come up with lots and lots of, of um, different questions, some of which are the grandest of questions, questions which are so grand that um, the answers must certainly be very speculative but very interesting. Um, these kinds of questions, the ones listed here about the multiverse, inflation, um, firewalls, um, EP equals EPR, and all the, all the things we've heard about this week which are on the grander scales, none of which will I talk about, because I think, um, the, first of all, they're very speculative questions, but also my colleagues who will talk after me will almost certainly cover them. Um, and I will not talk about many other topics which are very interesting, uh, simply because there isn't time. Um, um, so what I'm going to do is pick on a few, a few themes which I think somehow fit together and uh, are sort of special in their own ways. So um, the first one is the fact that in a number of different circumstances, subjects have developed in, in truly impressive ways um, with the use of highly sophisticated numerical techniques. So for example, one of the big developments over the last couple of years has been the conformal bootstrap, which promises to, um, promises to produce um, results relating to theories that a few years ago we wouldn't have had a hope of saying anything about. Um, I should say, by the way, I'm making comments here which are not particularly visionary because they are the comments made by many of the speakers, um, and it's, I'm just reiterating in some sense their vision. Um, the vision here, of course, is to produce, um, produce results in long-standing um, uh, systems, for example, the three-dimensional Ising model, uh, which has um, been the subject of a lot of work over the last 80 years or so, and finally they're cracking it, and, and we're, we're seeing some real precision um, results, which may in, indeed in the end lead to some deep understanding of the underpinnings of the model. So, and, and then, of course, uh, with regard to this particular conference, the idea of being able to say something about the zero-two theory is very exciting. Uh, another completely different subject, which I don't think was talked about at this conference, but nevertheless promises to be exciting, is that finally there seems to be some progress in doing computations, numerical computations, in um, N equals 4 supersymmetric Yang-Mills using lattice techniques. So there is in particular a, a formulation based on a twisted version of the theory, which has at least great potential for producing interesting um, Results and of course, from the perspective of the um, holographic correspondence, that would be a numerical way in looking in, in a numerical window 
into looking at properties of quantum gravity, which, which arise at finite um, n in SUN theories. Um, and, and lastly, um, this is a sort of gratuitous comment about a subject which is very vast and which many people have worked on and talked about at this conference, namely the connection between um, the holographic connection with condensed matter. But, but I just wanted to mention this here because there have been some extraordinarily clever numerical simulations in general relativity which have aim, aimed at understanding, um, understanding what sorts of theories can be produced from this correspondence. And that's stimulated work which, um, I mean, numerical relativity, of course, has been around for a long time in the context of cosmological computations, but there's been this new avenue um, producing weird and wonderful um, solutions to Einstein's theory which subject to weird and wonderful boundary conditions which have been, um, uh, which are needed in order to explain condensed matter systems. So moving on to a different circle of ideas, and this is the one which perhaps um, covers most, the most, um, the things which have struck me most about this conference are the circle of ideas which concern um, subjects that try and get away from space-time uh, uh, space in order to produce um, observables from which one might deduce the presence of space-time. In other words, uh, uh, subjects associated with emergence um, of space-time. And I've, I'm, I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about these topics. Um, I think the one, the topic or the general, the general theme that this conference will be remembered for, at least I will remember it for, is the many different ways in which the notions of entanglement have come together. This confluence of ideas, of course entanglement is an age-old subject within quantum mechanics. I think it dates back to Schrodinger in almost 100 years ago, um, but, and it's been around in many different guises um, and influences many fields um, uh, far away from our own, but somehow it's come together in this conference in different ways, many different ways, um, and we need, we need to, clearly this needs to be refined. Um, what are the tools for refinement? Well, something that wasn't talked about very much, but seems to be very interesting. I, I think this, this was um, uh, talked about in one of the parallel sessions, is the um, tool, um, the, the, <coughs> the tool which is known as mirror, which is um, the way of using the renormalization group to, for quantum critical systems, which has, I think, evolved out of the condensed matter community, but which is making, which is beginning to make very significant statements about the way in which space-time might emerge in the holographic um, context. So one of the questions, of course, which came up in, in various talks was, can one understand how the nonlinear Einstein equations emerge in, in gen, uh, from this kind of picture? More generally, what's the connection between um, geometry and entanglement, which goes on, well, I put the quotes in, just to signify that the, it, this is a sort of a, um, a slogan for that uh, connection between geometry and entanglement, EPR equals ER. Um, another topic which was talked a lot about was, the, uh, was higher spin theories. And so an obvious question is, is there some generalization of the notion of um, Ryu Takenagi entropy to these higher spin theories? And more generally, um, there are many other questions that came up about higher spin. Um, and one overriding question that comes up in the discussion of higher spin theories um, in the context of string theory is the question about whether um, string theory with its massive states is some Higgs-like broken symmetry phase of an underlying theory which is some enormous higher spin theory vastly bigger than um, the Vasiliev theory but maybe um, generalization of, of that theory. So, as I say, this is just a list of topics which, which have come to my mind in this conference and before, um, and I don't, um, and other people, I'm sure, would have other uh, topics on their lists. Um, so, the subject of scattering amplitudes is something which was talked about a lot here. It's a subject which is hugely worked on elsewhere. I mean, it has, it has its own conference, um, and um, there's been an enormous amount of really heroic work by various groups of people. Um, this was summarized, I was at a conference in Paris a couple of weeks ago, the Amplitudes Conference, which was a week-long conference, as dense with talks as this conference, but entirely about amplitudes. 
Um, and they, and, and these, these, the modern way in which amplitudes are calculated, of course, is not to use individual Feynman diagrams, but to package classes of diagrams together in various different ways to calculate on-shell <coughs> processes, um, which um, looks very promising in certain respects. Um, so, um, for example, for the n equals 4 superspectric Yang-Mills theory, there are a number of people who talked here about the way in which um, the integrability of the theory makes it plausible that we will have, at, in the short term, or in the medium term perhaps, an exact expression or an exact formulation of the planar amplitudes of the theory. Precisely what that means, I'm not sure, because I'm not sure whether or not one would expect to get an, an analytic statement about the theory at all coupling constants, or again, use numerical methods to calculate it. Another apparently different approach is the approach um, which looks very deep mathematically of um, called a name that I can't actually pronounce, um, ampli am amplituhedron, um, where um, one packages together um, all the Feynman diagrams, all the integrands of the Feynman diagrams at any given genus into this, um, this geometric um, quantity. And it looks very elegant mathematically, but there seems to be some way to go before it's, it, it can be used to calculate the real amplitude. And one question that came to mind is, since these two, pros since these two approaches are calculating the same thing, it would be interesting to know how they're related to each other. And then, of course, it would be very interesting to go beyond the planar. I mean, the folklore is that since the theory is integrable at the planar level, one can't really hope to say much about the non-planar extension. But I think there's some evidence that, um, that given the planar diagrams and given unitarity, um, there ought to be a way of proceeding that would, um, that would get the non-planar extensions. Uh, then, of course, big questions about how you extend this to gravity. Um, another major topic in this area are the scattering equations that were talked about here by, by Kachaza and by Louise Dolan. Um, and there is then there are issues about the relationship of that approach to these other approaches. And they, these equations are particularly elegant within the context of string theory. Those are the string-like formulations of Yang-Mills theory. And so it would be nice to understand that deep, deeper. In all these topics, there's perhaps the most amazing thing is the symbiosis with new ideas in mathematics. So that the kinds of functions that come into these calculations, which I've listed a few of here, are, um, are of great interest to certain types of mathematicians. And there's been work done by mathematicians on very similar topics, motivated partly by the work on amplitudes and partly the work on amplitudes motivated by their work. Um, and that's, in this area, this is probably the, most, the single most interesting feature. But even more wonderful things happen when you look at string theory. Um, so in string theory, um, we, if you look at perturbative amplitudes, then there are different things you can do. You can ask what's the connection between string theory and field theory. Um, you can ask about the, the um, connection between the low energy expansion and perturbation theory. Um, the pure Spinner formulation and the Ramon never Schwartz. The, the, but the virtue, the virtue of string theory, of course, is that at every order in perturbation theory, there's just one diagram, and there are no ultraviolet divergences. So um, uh, studying string theory might give a clue as to how you might get into um, a deeper understanding of the field theory limit. Um, so we heard some, a talk yesterday by, um, by Stieberger um, about work by him and his collaborators and there are other people involved in unraveling beautiful connections between the tree-level uh, expansion and, and, um, um, and this mathematics I've just been talking about. Um, in particular, there is a, an almost wondrous uh, projection you can do on the open string um, to produce the closed string amplitudes, which has been studied quite independently by Francis Brown um, uh, in, who introduced this notion of single value multiple polylogarithms, which to us would simply be the, well, would be something like the KLT projection. Um, so big questions, what is the extension of this to higher genus? There you should get generalizations of these multiple polylogarithms. The multiple poly polylogarithms are associated with genus zero surfaces, so it's natural to think you'll get these higher genus multi 
put it on. Um, I'm going to flash through this because I've got no time, but we, we, the pure spinner formalism is a very efficient formalism for looking at low genus calculations. It's the formalism that was used by these people I just mentioned to look at the endpoint functions for open and closed strings. And in principle, it's a formalism that's useful for looking at backgrounds uh, containing Ramon and Ramon floods. But we don't know, it, it lacks any intuitive geometrical origin. It was created by one person as if by, by magic. Um, so there are questions about whether or not it, it's something that can be used, is well defined even for higher loops. That's a question that one should try and understand. Um, and in particular, it would be very nice to understand how it might be related, how the two, this formalism might be related to a von never schwartz um, I've got no minutes left, which means I'm eating into my time. Um, that, let, I've got a couple more transparencies, though. Um, so here is a fantasy. Since there's only one diagram with any order in string perturbation theory, and since the low energy limit, since it, so there is a limit of string theory which is supposed to reproduce field theory, is there any sense in which one might hope to produce these wonderful field theory results by looking at higher genus string theory amplitudes and using general features, some of which have, many of which um, have been un uncovered by papers by um, Edward Witten and, and Danagi and others, um, in, order to, in order to arrive at a statement about um, supergravity, for example, at a given number of loops. Non-perturbatively, it's known that supergravity is not a, a, a consistent limit of string theory. Um, beyond perturbation theory, um, the um, non-perturbative dualities that string theory has um, uh, it constrain the theory in, in, in very um, beautiful ways, at least at low order in the low energy expansion, lead, leading to all sorts of non-renormalization theorems. And one set of um, one body of work which I've been involved in is looking at these dualities for the amplitudes for higher rank gauge groups, the gauge groups that arise when you compactify the type 2 theory on, on a torus. And these, these, um, this leads to a statement about the BPS interactions in which the coefficients, the modular dependence of these interactions, is associated with um, Langdon's Eisenstein series, which, are, um, uh, which arise in, in, in number theory, um, and it's very specific Eisenstein series which have rather ma magical properties. This is just a tip of some iceberg, um, which looks absolutely tantalizing. So we'd like to know more about that at higher order and about its further connections with number theory. Um, and I, I, put, I put on a rather gratuitous last slide here because um, even though this isn't new to this conference and even though I've got nothing particular to say about it, I think this connection with number theory that was uncovered um, following I guess the initial work by Aguchi, Oguri, and Tachikawa, this generalization of monstrous moonshine is quite remarkable. Um, it's, it's, it, it gives a role for mo modular forms. It connects um, them to, in this recent work, um, connect, connecting them to Niemeyer lattices with all sorts of intriguing connections with BPS counting, which is seen from a diff completely different perspective in other work um, which involves mo modular forms. Well, I've rushed through all that. My overwhelming feeling, however, is that I, 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 my talk is nothing compared to the talks that have been given at this conference. It's been an absolutely wonderful conference, and I'm very grateful to everyone, most notably the organizers. <laughs>